Hello students, this is Dr. Lyons, because who else would it be? And in this chapter, we're going to get into cellular respiration. So we've already actually talked a little bit about cellular respiration, because we, we talked a little bit about ATP and kind of stuff related to that. Uh, you know some of the basics. You know essentially that cellular respiration is taking food and extracting energy from it and, and putting that energy into ATP. Uh, but what we're going to do here is we're going to go into this process in a little bit more detail. Uh, because this is such an important process, it's important to know a little bit more about how it works. So first of all, what is it? Why is it important? As I was saying before, it's essentially how we take uh, energy that is in food and we extract that energy and we put it into energy in the form of ATP. Uh, we discussed in the last chapter how ATP is the actual molecule that our cells can use because our cells can't directly function using, say, glucose or other sugars or proteins or lipids. Those things have to be converted into ATP and cellular respiration is the process of, of doing that. So why is it important? So it's really important to pretty much every every one of us because inside of all of us right now, cellular respiration is going on because we require a huge, huge, huge quantities of ATP uh, in order to, to function. So cellular respiration is, is really a pretty important uh, topic. It's maybe one of the more impo important topics we'll cover this semester given just how much we will rely upon it. So some of the, the basics first. So, uh, so this is showing the equation. So over here on the left, we have the reactants. Over here on the right, we have the products. Uh, so we take glucose, right? So a simple sugar, uh, and we take some oxygen, right? That's why we breathe oxygen is for this very purpose. Uh, cellular respiration happens, uh, and what we produce is ATP. Uh, and as byproducts, we produce some water and some carbon dioxide, right? So why we are exhaling carbon dioxide right, right now is because of this process, because of cellular respiration. And so there's uh, three different steps of cellular respiration that we're going to go into uh, and we're not going to go into them in, in crazy detail uh, but we're going to kind of get the basics of each of the the three steps of this process uh, so first we'll go into glycolysis then the citric acid cycle and finally we'll get into the electron transport chain uh, and here's a kind of another overview of of what's going on uh, there's a couple things that i want to point out here a couple of kind of important overarching things uh, that I want you to know about how cellular respiration works. So one thing that this figure shows uh, is the location of, of where things are happening. Uh, so we have the cytoplasm, right? So that is the fluid inside the cells that you learned about back in chapter four. Uh, and this is a mitochondria. So part of cellular respiration takes place in the cytoplasm uh, and part of it takes place in the mitochondria. Right. We learned about how mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell, and that's because that's where the most of the, the bulk of the ATP is, is produced there. So that's one important thing that I want to point out here. Uh, another important thing that I wanted to point out uh, has to do with how these different cycles, uh, different processes are linked to each other. Right. So we've got three different stages. So glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. Uh, and they're very much linked to each other. Uh, and they're linked because products that come out of glycolysis go into the citric acid cycle. And products that come out of glycolysis also go to the electron transport chain. Uh, the citric acid cycle receives products from glycolysis. So the products of glycolysis are the reactants of the citric acid cycle. Uh, and the products of the citric acid cycle then go into the electron transport chain. So we have kind of this this step by step by step sort of thing here uh, where one step leads to another leads to another. So you can't really have the electron transport chain without the previous two steps and you can't have the citric acid cycle without glycolysis. So all of these things are, are, are involved uh, and, they're, and they're all linked to each other. One last thing that I want to point out is that ATP is produced in each one of these three stages. Uh, however, you're going to find out that the bulk of the ATP is produced during the electron transport chain. Okay, so first we'll, we'll delve into glycolysis uh, a little bit. Uh, 
right? So we start with glucose. Glucose is a six carbon molecule. That's why you see six uh, gray circles here. So each of those gray circles are meant to represent uh, uh, one carbon. Uh, and so right off the bat, what happens is we're actually going to use up some ATP. So you might remember back from chapter five, we talked about activation energy, which is the energy that is required to get a reaction going, to get it started. Uh, that's what's going on here. We actually have to use a little bit of energy to get this process going, right? So we need some energy in order to break apart uh, this, this glucose. So we use two ATPs at the beginning of the process. Uh, so we split apart the, the glucose into these two uh, three carbon molecules. Uh, and so we use 2ATP there. Uh, and then what we then produce uh, is these things called NADH. Uh, so what NADH stands for uh, isn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, but what you need to know is that NADH is a carrier for something very important. Uh, so you see these, these little yellow dots right here, these yellow circles with uh, negative symbols through it. So can you think of uh, a very small thing we talked about in chapter two that, is, uh, that has a negative charge to it? Uh, you should be thinking electrons, right? So we talked about how there are protons and neutrons and electrons. These are the parts of an atom. Protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and electrons are negative. So what these uh, circles are uh, with negative signs are electrons. So NADH is a, is a carrier for electrons. You can think of NADH as the uber for electrons. Uh, and this NADH is gonna carry these electrons to another part, to another stage of cellular respiration, right? So can you guess where those electrons might get used? You know, so think about what are the names of the three stages that we're, that we're talking about here, right? So we have glycolysis, the citric acid cycle in the electron transport chain. So it should be pretty obvious to you that these electrons are gonna be used during that last part. They're gonna get used during the electron transport chain. So we make some NADH that has electrons. So we have those Ubers carrying around their electrons. Uh, and then finally, what we produce at the very end of glycolysis uh, is four ATP molecules. So for every glucose molecule that goes into glycolysis, uh, we produce four ATPs, but we burn two ATPs. So the net result uh, is two ATPs that are, that are made during glycolysis. Okay, then uh, there's a kind of intermediate step that occurs between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. Uh, and essentially what happens uh, is that we break one more carbon off of these three carbon molecules to produce some carbon dioxide. As a, as a byproduct, uh, and we create two more NADH. So remember, the NADH, those are the, the Ubers for these uh, electrons that are gonna get used later during the electron transport chain. Uh, we bind an enzyme onto these two carbon molecules. Uh, so these are, these are called acetic acid, these two carbon molecules, and we bind the enzyme to it. Uh, in the enzyme, you can kind of think of that as something that helps this, this molecule get into the mitochondria where it's gonna be used next. So now we're gonna leave the, the cytoplasm and go into the mitochondria. So now we're at the, the citric acid cycle. Uh, and so this, like I was saying, is inside of the, the mitochondria. So we have that acetic acid uh, that came from glycolysis. So acetic, acetic acid enters this uh, cycle uh, and it binds onto this four carbon molecule. Uh, and so what happens is we go through this cyclical process uh, where each time we go around, we add acetic acid to it. Uh, and what gets produced uh, is some carbon dioxide. So that's the waste product. We produce some ATP. We produce some more NADH, right? So remember NADH, that is the, the little carrier for these electrons and we produce some FADH2. So you can see FADH2 looks a lot like NADH, and that's because it achieves the same purpose. It's a different molecule, but it's, it's doing the, the same thing essentially. So you can think of NADH as like the Uber for electrons, and FADH2 is like the lift for electrons, right? They're two different molecules, but they're doing the, the same exact thing. So then finally, we're gonna go to the electron transport chain, uh, and then we're gonna take this ATP, well, I'm sorry, not this ATP. We're gonna take this NADH and this FADH 
and that's when they're going to be used. So the electron transport chain, uh, it takes place in the mitochondria, as does the, the citric acid cycle. Uh, and so there's uh, one thing that I want you to know about the mitochondria uh, that, that is going to be important here. So the mitochondria has an inner membrane inside of it. That's the, the really key thing here. Uh, so this kind of uh, kidney bean looking thing is a mitochondria. So we have this membrane that's on the outside and then a membrane that is on the inside. So if it's got two different membranes, one on the outside and one on the inside, how many uh, empty spaces would there be inside of the mitochondria? Right, so there should be two spaces, right? There's going to be one that is between the two different membranes, between the outer and the inner membrane. Uh, so the book refers to that simply as the space between membranes. Uh, and then we have this, this empty space that is on the very inside of the innermost membrane. Uh, and that space is called the, the matrix because believe it or not, uh, Dr. Um, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, I'm totally screwing up this joke. Anyway, the guy from the Matrix invented this, but obviously I'm joking and I forgot his name, so I totally ruined the joke. So sorry about that, guys. I'm just not on it today, I guess. Anyway, here's the mitochondria, and we're going to use these, this inner membrane uh, uh, in order to, to use the electron transport chain. Uh, and we're going to use uh, diffusion uh, as well. Uh, so diffusion is going to be a, a really, really important part of this. And so you might remember back from Chapter 5, diffusion is the movement of solute uh, from an area where it's in very high concentration uh, to an area where it's in very low concentration. Okay, so this is going to show us what goes on with the electron transport chain. And so I know this is kind of a complex diagram, uh, and so I'm going to work us through it. Uh, and first let me orient you to what you are looking at. So all of what you're seeing here is inside of the mitochondria. Uh, this gray thing is the inner mit mitochondria membrane. So that is the membrane on the very inside part of the, of the mitochondria. Uh, this kind of uh, tan color up here, or, br or brownish color up here, this is the space that is between the membranes, right? So if this is the inner membrane, up here would be the outer membrane, and this is that space that's between them. So that means that this kind of light sand colored area down here, this is the very innermost uh, part of the, of the membrane, right? So, or, or I'm sorry, this is the very innermost space within the mitochondria. Uh, so this is the matrix part of, the, uh, of the, the mitochondria. Okay, and then you see there are these purple things uh, embedded within this membrane, right? So we talked about plasma membranes and we talked about how oftentimes there is a type of macromolecule that is embedded within them that helps move things across those membranes. So these purple things are proteins, right? So proteins are the macromolecules that are often embedded within membranes uh, and, uh, and they're what push things uh, from one side of a membrane to the other side of a membrane. Okay, and so these three proteins that you see here, uh, how they kind of work is, is like little pumps uh, and like any pump, they need some electricity to run. Uh, and where are they going to get that electricity? They get them from these electrons, right? So here's NADH, right? Remember we said that's like the Uber for electrons. And here's FADH2. That was like the lift for electrons. Uh, and these electrons are going to give power to these protein pumps. Uh, and so what these protein pumps do is they take hydrogen ions. Uh, so you might remember from chapter two, an ion is an atom that has a charge, whether it be positive or negative. And how they end up having a charge is by gaining an electron or losing an electron. So a hydrogen ion is a hydrogen atom that has lost an electron. So it has a, a positive charge. Uh, and so these proteins are gonna pump these hydrogen ions uh, from the, the matrix area out to the space between membranes. So what they're going to do is they're going to build up a concentration of hydrogen ions uh, in this area up here. So we're going to have a high concentration up here and a low concentration down here. Uh, that's what's, what's going to happen here. Okay, and so as these electrons are jumping from one protein to another uh, to another, what will actually draw them through these proteins is oxygen. So this is where the crucially important 
part of oxygen comes in. Oxygen acts as uh, what is known as uh, the final electron acceptor. So the only way that these electrons can move from protein to protein to protein is if there is an oxygen there to accept them at the very end of all of this. If there's no oxygen, then this whole process can't take place. The electron transport chain just doesn't work if it doesn't have oxygen. So the electrons, they bounce from protein to protein to protein. They bind onto an oxygen. Uh, that oxygen and that electron uh, binds to two hydrogen ions and we form water. So this is why we need oxygen and why we produce uh, water as a byproduct of all this, right? So all of the oxygen that, that you are consuming right now, this is where it's getting used. This is why uh, we need to have oxygen in the atmosphere. So you're probably also wondering what this skull and crossbones thing is here, right? So the, the publisher of this diagram put this skull and crossbones here uh, as, a, as a reminder that this is a really key thing uh, that's going on here. Right? This is why we need oxygen. Uh, if you don't get oxygen, you end up like this, you end up dead. Uh, and if you were to accidentally ingest something that inhibits what's going on here, you would also be dead. So that's actually what, what cyanide does. Right? So you might have heard of cyanide as this incredibly toxic uh, chemical. Uh, it is what uh, one cult uh, in South America very famously ingested uh, with Kool-Aid and, and a bunch of people died from drinking that cyanide. Uh, what cyanide does is it inhibits oxygen from doing its job. Uh, and if oxygen can't do its job, then none of this takes place. Uh, and essentially your body doesn't make any ATP. Uh, and as we talked about before, your body needs a crap ton of ATP to work. So if you ingest cyanide, it prevents your body from making uh, enough ATP to, to be able to function uh, and you die, uh, which is why you shouldn't ever drink the Kool-Aid. So if you ever find yourself in a cult and they're passing around Kool-Aid, do not drink that Kool-Aid. That is bad for your health. Okay, finally, the last step that's going on here uh, is, is what, you, what you see right here. So this is a very special type of protein called ATP synthase. By the way, uh, words that you see that end in ACE uh, are proteins. Uh, so like we talked about lactase, that is the protein that breaks down lactose. Uh, things that end in ose are sugars like glucose and fructose. So lactase breaks down lactose. Uh, ATP synthase, because it ends in ace, we know that it is a protein. Uh, and this protein functions a little bit differently from these other proteins here. What this protein does is it kind of works like a hydroelectric dam. So what a hydroelectric dam does uh, is it is on a river and as water flows through this dam, uh, that water pushes this big wheel. Uh, and as that wheel turns round and round and round, it generates electricity. So what a hydroelectric dam does is it essentially turns the kinetic energy uh, that is in that water, is that water is moving through the dam, uh, it, can it turns it into potential energy in the form of electricity. What this, uh, what ATP synthase is doing is something very similar. Uh, so it's converting kinetic energy in the form of hydrogen ions moving across it uh, into chemical energy in the form of ATP. And so you might be thinking, well, why is it that these hydrogen ions go through ATP synthase? Well, that's where diffusion comes into place, right? So we talked about diffusion in the last chapter. That's the movement of solute from an area where it's in high concentration to an area where it's in low concentration. Uh, so if we have a high concentration of hydrogen ions up here and a low concentration down here, naturally hydrogen ions are gonna move uh, from, from the top uh, down to the bottom. They're gonna move from the space between membranes to that inner area, to that matrix area. And as these hydrogen ions go through here, it causes part of this ATP synthase to spin around uh, and that produces ATP. So the bulk of the ATP that you are consuming uh, comes from this right here. It comes from ATP synthase just spinning round and round and round. Uh, the spinning motion comes from the hydrogen ions going through it and that produces ATP for us. So I know that that was a lot of uh, steps, but just kind of to reiterate the really important things, right? So we have electrons that come from the first two uh, stages from glycolysis and from the citric acid cycle. Those electrons power protein pumps, uh, 
these, uh, these protein pumps pump hydrogen ions from one area to another area. Oxygen accepts those electrons at the end. And these hydrogen ions, because they're in a high concentration up here, they want to diffuse back to the other side. And as they do, ATP synthase turns that kinetic energy into chemical energy. So that's what's going on in the, in the electron transport chain. Okay, so let's take a look at, at what we produced here. So glycolysis makes two ATP um, molecules directly, and it produces two NADH uh, molecules. Citric acid cycle makes some NADH and some FADH, uh, and also produces some ATP, uh, two ATP molecules uh, per uh, glucose molecule. The electron transport chain produces roughly 28 ATP molecules uh, per glucose molecule, right? So this is, uh, this is an approximation uh, because it's not like there's a direct chemical reaction going on, right? So we were relying on hydrogen ions flowing from one side to the other, you know, so we have multiple electrons coming in from these two different, uh, two different uh, stages uh, that are making ATP molecules. So it's, it's on, on average about 28 ATP molecules, but it could be a little bit more or a little bit less per glucose molecule. Uh, so what we produce on average is about 32 ATP molecules per glucose in all of the three uh, uh, stages that we were talking about. So that's what comes out of cellular respiration. Okay, I did just wanna briefly mention uh, what happens when there's no oxygen. Uh, so when there's no oxygen available, uh, there's a switch to what's known as anaerobic respiration. So this term aerobic uh, refers to uh, oxygen. You know, think of like aerobic exercise. You know, when you're doing aerobic exercise, you know, you're sucking in a lot of oxygen. Uh, so anaerobic means without oxygen. And so fermentation is an anaerobic uh, uh, respiration where we break down food energy and, 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 and we extract food energy, but do it without oxygen. And so how this more or less works uh, is, is we use glycolysis, uh, but we don't use the citric acid cycle and we don't use the electron transport chain. So fermentation really just makes use of two ATP uh, molecules per glucose molecule. So it's, it's really very, very inefficient. You know, because we just learned from the last slide, if you have oxygen, you can make 32 ATPs on average per glucose molecule. If you're undergoing fermentation, you can only do two ATP molecules uh, per glucose molecule. Uh, so then you might wonder, so why does fermentation even exist if it's so inefficient? Well, we in fact use fermentation at certain times. So if, you know, say you're, you're, say you're sprinting, you know, really, really hard, you know, after say, uh, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, you know, whatever, uh, your muscles are going to run out of oxygen because they, because there's a huge demand for ATP and consequently there's a huge demand for oxygen. So what your, your muscle cells do is they switch to fermentation. Uh, because if they don't have any oxygen, well, you can't do all of cellular respiration anyway. So what they do is they switch to fermentation, uh, which is kind of like a second best. You know, it's not it's not going to be able to produce nearly as much ATP as you could if you had oxygen. But producing two ATPs per glucose molecule, you know, it's better than not producing any ATP at all. So that's why our, our muscle cells will switch to fermentation. Uh, when we are exercising really, really vigorously. Of course, there is a limit to that because, uh, you know, because eventually, you know, you can't, you can't just sprint, you know, indefinitely. Uh, eventually what will happen is that the demand for ATP uh, will exceed the, the available ATP, uh, even with fermentation going on, uh, at which point you just got to stop. Uh, one, kind of, um, one kind of interesting side effect of this is that when you your when your muscle cells undergo fermentation, uh, they produce lactic acid as a as a byproduct. Um, what they would normally produce uh, is is uh, is citric acid that then you know goes into the citric acid cycle. Uh, but what is produced uh, in fermentation is lactic acid, uh, and that's actually what causes your muscles to to have a burning sensation when you are exercising really vigorously. Uh, 
you know, because acid isn't really nice to have to have in your muscles. So when you exercise vigorously and you're feeling a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of burning, uh, that's because your your muscle has has switched to fermentation and now lactic acid uh, is being produced, uh, and you know, and that can then cause some soreness, you know, the next day because you're you know, because your, your cells are, are, are damaged from that lactic acid and they're in the recovering from it. So there, there are then uh, organisms uh, that kind of specialize in doing fermentation. So for instance, uh, beer and wine yeast, uh, they uh, use fermentation, uh, but instead of producing lactic, lactic acid, they uh, actually produce ethyl alcohol, right? So this is something that, that humans have known about for thousands of years. You know, because humans like to get drunk and, you know, long, long time ago in, in lots of different cultures, people realized that leaving out sugary things, whether it be grains or grapes or honey, uh, they learned a long time ago that if you leave things out like that, uh, it turns into ethyl alcohol, uh, which then, you know, produces the effect of, of, of being drunk. So yeast uh, is what actually makes this happen. So any liquor or beer or wine or whatever. Uh, is produced using fermentation, using yeast, which is a, a very small uh, a microbe. Uh, it's a type of fungus, uh, and they undergo fermentation, but instead of making lactic acid, they make ethyl alcohol. So kind of a thought question that I always pose to, my, to, to all my students is, you know, think about what life would be like if we did lactic acid, uh, if instead of having lactic acid fermentation, right? So instead of producing lactic acid, what would happen if we, if when we did fermentation, if we produced ethyl alcohol, right? So think about, think about that for, for, for a second, right? So, so what would happen would be that your body would produce, you know, ethyl alcohol. So meaning every time you exercised, you would get drunk. Uh, because every time your body switched, your muscles switched to fermentation, uh, it would, your muscles would be producing ethyl alcohol rather than lactic acid. So essentially all the people at the, at the gym, you know, they would, they would be drunk. Uh, and instead of going to bars, you know, all of us humans, we would just go to the gym because we wouldn't need to go to bars because we would be able to produce our own ethyl alcohol. You know, so that is, uh, you know, these are the, the thought questions, you know, that, that keep me up at night. Uh, and I hope maybe someday they'll keep you up at night too. Okay, so that's all I've got to tell you about uh, cellular respiration. Uh, in the next chapter, we're going to talk about photosynthesis, which is uh, a related and very important uh, reaction as well.